So I'm going to do this very briefly for you because we've kind of done it already, but I'm going to start with the other stuff uh, momentarily. So keep in mind that the heart will beat by itself. It has its own battery. Its battery is called a pacemaker, and more specifically, it's called the SA node or sinoatrial node that's located in the right atrium. That's what we got over here. A better picture to understand this is this one here, which I haven't shown you before, but when you watch the video, it was there. So what's going to happen here, there's five parts to it. This is where it's going to the SA node, and it's going to send its electricity to both sides of the atria, the right and the left. So that's why the right beats first, or contracts first, the right atrium contracts first, but it's like a split, split, split second that the left atrium is going to happen right afterwards. But with the naked eye, it looks like the right and left atria beat it, or contract at the same time. Okay? It's because the right A or the SA node spreads its electricity. But when I say electricity, we, you know we're all talking about an action potential, right? That's what that is. Eventually, the action potential will go to our second part, which is going to be the AV node, the atrioventricular node, which is also located in the right atrium. Then it's going to spread its electricity, or action potential, down something called the AV bundle, or like I told you before, bundle of HIS, H-I-S, capital H, some guy's name, I believe. Then it goes down the interventricular septum as two bundle branches, all right, we have the right and left bundle branches. They go down here until it reaches the apex of the heart. So this is how, even though the, uh, the, the action potential begins on one side of the heart, how is it that the ventricles beat at the same time, precisely? It's because both of them will go down the bundle branches to the apex of the heart at the same time. Then from here, it spreads upwards as Purkinje fibers. And as I showed you before, you have to think about those Purkinje fibers are just not on the right and left side of the ventricles, but think of a three-dimensional thing. They're coming out of the board also, and into the board also. So their Purkinje fibers are all around the ventricles, not just on the right and left is what many people mislead you to think. Okay? Now, a few things about this. The SA node, the pacemaker, sinoatrial node, that is our pacemaker and is going to set the pace of the heart. It will beat by itself. It doesn't have to have a neural, it doesn't have to have a nerve going to it. It will beat to itself, beat for itself, as long as it does have nutrients and oxygen going to that area. Okay? It will beat for about 70 to 80 beats per minute and set the pace. Now, like I said before, the nervous system has to be hooked up to it only to make it go faster or slower. Times of, let's say, you take one of my exams, you want your heartbeat to go a little bit faster so that the blood can be pumped out of the heart at a faster pace to get to your brain, to bring the glucose up there so you can think of the right answers, right? So we expect that to do that. So the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, will be hooked up to that to make it go faster by the sympathetics and slower by the parasympathetics. So that's why you need the nervous system hooked up. But if it's not hooked up, it will beat at 70 to 80 beats per minute and stay constantly at that level as long as the tissue's not going to die. If that should go on, that's great. Then it's going to be passed on to the next part, which is the AV node, which is also in the right atrium. <clears throat> like a relay race, you're passing the baton to the next person. If the pacemaker doesn't work, in other words, if the SA node doesn't work, that tissue becomes dead for some reason, a heart attack can do that, something can do that, then the AV node is going to be the one that's going to take over and be the pacemaker of the heart. Now, you're not going to die right, right then and there. What will happen is you will see differences because the AV node beats at a slower pace, 40 to 50 beats per minute. So what will happen is, uh, you're walking 10 blocks, no problem. The doctor says, uh, you know, a year later, says everything's okay. Yeah, but you know what? For the past couple weeks, I'm walking the same 10 blocks, but after about a, one block, I'm getting like short of breath. Something's not going on properly. 
So we're going to do an EKG, and lo and behold, we'll see that the SA node is not firing. And it's that it's because of the AV node is taking over at a slower pace. And that's what will happen. So we just have to put in a new pacemaker. Okay? If the AV node doesn't work, then the AV bundle kicks in. Now the AV bundle beats at a much slower rate, only 20 to 40 beats per minute. Now at this rate, this is going to put you in a coma. Okay? This is like the emergency lights going on in the school. All right? If they are lights, you can find your way to the exits and stuff, but it's difficult to take an exam. You're going to be in a coma, all right? That kind of thing. All right? So that's what will happen over here. It has a very slow rate. The right and left bundle branches, they go down there, and then finally you've got the Purkinje fibers that go up um, around surrounding the ventricle. Okay? Does that make sense? So it's we're following this action potential from one step to another. Okay, and you can do it, you see it over here too, going through all those different steps. Okay? All right, now let's talk about your favorite subject, the cardiac action potential. Raise your hand if you love the action potential. All right, I did that because no one's raising their hand and you're all in the same boat, okay? I've realized that. So I'm going to make it a little bit, there is parts over here you just have to remember from A and P1. All right. He dealt with an action potential of a neuron. He talked about an action potential of a muscle. But I'm just going to review things, but I think the review is going to shed some light on things. Remember, it's a jolt of electricity is the action potential. You can't just have one jolt and expect it to do work. You've got to have a brigade of action potentials, a brigade of electricity jolts, one after the other. So, the best way, there's an action potential that's in the SA node, in the ventricles, in the bundle of his, uh, in the AV node, there's a, and they, they all look different. And I'm going to get into that in a moment. But the best way I can explain it is let's look at an action potential at a Purkinje fiber. We've got to start someplace, and I think it, it's easier for you to actually visualize the action potential of a Purkinje fiber to understand this. Now, they'll spike themselves, as much as you've seen with the SA node, okay? So, it works as one functional syncytium. In other words, once one fires, then the next cell will fire right after, the next cell will fire right after. If you remember what the, cyto what the um, histology of this cardiac muscle looks like, it's all branching. And the branching is going to help things to go much faster, the electricity going through here, much faster than other cells. Not only that, but you also have these wonderful things called the intercalated discs. This, the, uh, the cell junctions between each cardiac muscle cell. And it's specialized so that this electricity goes through it much quicker. Now let's talk about this action potential. There's different phases. I'm going to verbalize them over here by reading this up here, and then I'm going to take a moment and show you what it looks like um, as the sodium comes in and the calcium comes in and stuff. It'll make more sense to you, but i got to give it some labels first. Phase zero is depolarization. If you remember what depolarization is? Depolarization is the charge becomes more positive. Or it's the same thing as saying less negative. I always got upset when, when books would say that because they're saying less negative. That's the same thing as saying more positive. It's not a different thing, we just think about it, okay? This is when we have an influx of sodium. It makes sense. Sodium has a positive charge. So if the sodium gates open, sodium's gonna pour in. And when sodium pours in, is that going to make the, the cell more, inside the cell more positive or more negative? Positive. So it's going to make depolarization take place, right? It's going to become more positive, okay? Now when the sodium gates open, how do we know sodium goes in and doesn't go out? What, what is, well, what cation is most abundant outside the cells? Oh, uh, we got to review something. All right. The best way I can explain this is give me a moment, look at the picture. Thank you. 
My demonic called the salty banana. You need to know, is there more sodium outside? What's the most common cation outside the cell? What's the most common cation inside the cell? What's the most common anion outside the cell? What's the most common anion inside the cell? We all know what cations and anions are, right? Happy cat, cat it's anything with a positive charge. All right, if you want to think of cation, think of a cation, there's a positive charge there. All right, an anion, well, that's just the opposite. It's just, it's going to have the negative charge. Okay, old stuff, chemistry stuff. I have to assume you went through that. Okay, so we have two things to be concerned about, really. We have sodium, at least we can call it here. So we have sodium, and we have potassium. Is this a cation or anion? Cation. Cation or anion. Good. We also have chloride. Cation or anion. Good. We also have that. Phosphate. I know it looks weird, but that's what it is. Cation or anion? Good. Anion, right? Negative charge, negative charge, positive charge, positive charge, right? You need to know cations and anions, okay? Now, my question is this. What is the most abundant cation located outside of cells, in the extracellular fluid, in all cells? Sodium. What's the most abundant cation inside the cells? Potassium. Think of a salty banana. In a banana are cells. What is a banana loaded with that you learned from kindergarten? Potassium. So inside the banana is loaded with potassium. That's our most abundant cation. And we're pouring salt all over on the outside. What is salt made out of that you learned from kindergarten? Sodium and chloride, right? So you're going to have loads of sodium chloride outside the cell. Does that happen? You happy with that? Okay. The only one you got to really memorize is the phosphate is the most abundant anion inside the cell. So if you know the salty banana, I just knocked off these three things off for your mnemonic. This is the only one you got to memorize. All right. This is going to save you. All right. The salty banana. So if we have now let me do it color coded. If we have more sodium outside the cell, we do have sodium inside the cell, but not as abundant. If the sodium gates open on this banana peel, which way does the sodium want to go in? Or does it want to go in or does it want to go out? Go in. Why? Not so much a charge, but it's simple diffusion. A high concentration of sodium to a low concentration of sodium inside. From a high concentration to a low. When these gates open, the sodium wants to pour inside because it's going from a high concentration to a low. Simple diffusion. Make sense? If we have more potassium inside the cell, Then we do outside the cell. If the potassium channels open on this banana peel, which way does the potassium want to go? Out. It's going from a high concentration from inside to the low concentration on the outside. Does that make sense? If potassium leaves the cell, does inside the cell want to become negative or positive? Think about it. Negative. negative, because we're losing a positive charge. Does that make sense? If we open the sodium channels, sodium pours inside. Does that make inside the cell more positive, more negative? Positive. You see how you're working with this? It wasn't taught like this, was it? Okay. So, now, it should make sense. 
phase zero. And I'll show you where these phases are on the, on the actual potential. But now you understand that when the sodium gates open, sodium pours inside, i.e. influx of sodium. That makes inside the cell more positive or negative? Which one? Positive. So that's going to be depolarization. It becomes more positive. Then all of a sudden, the sodium channel gates close. Bam! Very fast. We reach a peak. That's what we call phase one. Now something odd happens here. We're throwing in another one. We have phase two. It's called a plateau phase. This is done. We haven't talked about calcium. But this is going to allow some calcium coming in, which has a positive charge, two positive. But it also opens potassium channels very slowly. If calcium comes in, is it going to make inside more positive or negative? Positive. If the potassium gates open, is it going to become more positive or negative inside? Negative. Because potassium wants to leave the cell, as you've seen on here. So look what's happening here. Some positives coming in, some positives going out. You realize it's going to not make it the, the actual potential go down or up. It's going to make it more of a plateau. Does that make sense? Okay. That's why we call that the plateau phase, and that's a key phase. That's when we have a nice strong contraction. If we can make that plateau phase long, you're going to have a nice strong contraction to push the blood forward. So we have ways that we can change this. Has any of you heard about calcium channel blockers? certain medication that allows the calcium to stay inside. It's not going to open up the gates, calcium channel, and let it go out anymore. It'll stay in there for a longer amount of time, giving you a nice, strong contraction. They use that for a lot of things in heart uh, diseases, right, from just the heart failure, so that the heart can push for a longer amount of time to a weak heart. You're going to be learning about these things. Then we got phase three, and now the potassium gates, they open up very quickly. And when it does, potassium is going to pour outside the cell. If it's going to pour outside the cell, is that going to make the cell inside more negative or more positive? Negative. So it's going to go down. We call that repolarization when it becomes more negative, or i.e. less positive. Same thing. And then we have the pacemaker phase. And what happens here is that, see, sodium is, the sodium channels are not very good. When they close, they're still leaky. So it's like taking this faucet over here, and I have it really tight, but for some reason, some drips still come out. So even though your sodium channels are closed, they're still leaky. They're allowing a little bit of sodium coming in. So what's happening here is that the, the, um, the actual potential is not flat because the sodium channel is still leaky. It's on an incline a little bit. It's allowing some potassium, I'm sorry, some sodium falling inside the cell, making it more positive or negative? Positive. So it's not flat, it's on an incline. So this is what's going on here. Now you're visualizing it. Here's the cell membrane up here. Extracellular fluids out there, intracellular fluids over here. This is the action potential. <coughs> right here, the sodium channels are very leaky. And I color-coded all this. I should have drew some little dotted line of sodium coming in here because it's making it leaky. This red area is here. This is where phase zero is. As sodium is getting leak is leaky, this is not flat. This is on an incline, making it a little positive. Then all of a sudden, the sodium channels are going to open all the way. And it's going to pour in sodium and making this depolarize. It's going to go shoot straight up making it more positive inside the cell. Until the sodium gates close very fast. BAM! That's phase one, the peak. Now we're going to have 
slow calcium coming in and slow potassium going out, giving it sort of a plateau. Positive coming in, positive going out. Does that make sense? Until the potassium channels open all the way very quickly and potassium is going to pour out of that cell, make it inside the cell more negative or positive? Negative. And that's why you have this repolarization phase going more negative. And then that whole thing repeats. Down here is where the potassium channels will close. Questions about that? Is that a good review for? I mean, it's a little bit different because you don't deal with the calcium with the uh, uh, action potential of the nerve. But it, it, the words should have been a, a good review for you. But that's how the cardiac muscle cell works. All right. A couple things about phase four. Again, phase four is this area here. We have this incline. Phase four is where we can control heart rate. Acetylcholine, part of the parasympathetic uh, system, ACH. Acetylcholine, when that kicks in, it's going to open up potassium channels. And when it does, it'll decrease the depolarization rate. When it does, it's going to make it, and I'll show you a picture of it, it's going to make the heart rate decrease. This is a condition we call bradycardia. Bradycardia, brady means slow, cardia meaning heart rate. This is a slow heart rate. At rest, it's less than 60 beats per minute. And hint, hint, you should know that. Bradycardia means it's less than 60 beats per minute at rest. You're going to see that word pop up a few other places. Then we have norepinephrine, any. Norepinephrine is going to increase the number and it's going to increase the rate of opening sodium channels, also calcium. This is going to allow more positive going in, i.e. depolarized would happen. We have more depolarizations happening, it's going to increase the heart rate. Each time an action potential happens, the, each, the, the space in between each uh, action potential is going to get closer, i.e. increasing the heart rate. If the heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute at rest, we call it tachycardia. Hint, hint. Know the differences between the two. Tachy meaning fast, cardio meaning heart rate. And I'm talking about at rest. I'm not asking you to run a 20, you know, 20 mile marathon, your heart rate's going faster. You're not at rest. Sure, there's tachycardia happening, but that's not anything unusual. That's an appropriate response. I'm talking about right now, you shouldn't be having 150 beats per minute at rest. Phase two, any questions? Yeah, is it all, like one thing that has palpitations? You can actually feel your heartbeat. That's, that's palpitations. These can lead to palpitations. You can actually feel the heartbeat without even putting your hand here. It's like, God, I feel something like you feel what you feel. That's what palpitations are. It's a sensation that you can actually feel your heartbeat. And when it's racing like that, it can happen like that. Okay? Is it related to the action potential? Everything's related to the heart and the action potential. But thi hyperthyroidism can cause power, um, palpitations. Hyperthyroidism can cause tachycardia. That's where I've actually showed you guys tactical party, right? I just mentioned that. Okay? All right. A key thing about phase two that I mentioned to you, this is the plateau phase, all right? When slow calcium comes in and slow potassium goes out, giving that plateau phase. The longer the plateau phase, the greater amount of calcium stays within the cell, and the greater the force of the next contraction because you have so much calcium that's staying inside the cell. Key thing, all right? Understand what calcium does in the plateau uh, phase and the significance of that. So this is what a normal action potential should be. Here's if we've got sympathetics, norepinephrine, notice that the action potentials are much closer to each other. The acetylcholine, parasympathetics, 
this one happens here, probably another one over here. They get further apart. So this is going to lower the heart rate, this will speed up the heart rate. Now, that's an action potential for Kinji fiber. And that's probably good, a, a good template for you guys. But what about the other action potentials throughout the heart? Well, if you understand that, then I'll just mention to you a few other uh, differences when you're comparing it to the Purkinje fiber. The action potential of the ventricles, the same as the Purkinje fiber, but a couple differences. The resting potential is flat. There is no leaky sodium channels in this. All right? And the cells don't excite themselves. They need something else to tell to do that. Okay? So this is what it kind of looks like. All right? If you understand what I showed you before in that picture, here's a similar picture. Notice over here, it's not on an incline, it's phase four. It's flat. Then you have depolarization, the peak, the plateau phase, repolarization. And it's kind of showing the same thing over here that I showed you in the other one. So, in, so here's our cell membrane. This is intracellular fluid, here's extracellular fluid. So sodium's coming in, calcium, potassium are going opposite directions. All right, then potassium's gonna pour out, and so forth. Okay? The action potential, the SA and AV node, there are no sodium channels in these guys. So what's gonna be causing the depolarization is calcium. The calcium channels uh, are going to be there, and that's what's going to depolarize the cells in these situations. It's just another positive charge, another cation. So this is just showing you different forms of action potential. So I can't really tell you an action potential looks like this in the heart. It depends on what part of the heart we're looking at. And this is going to help you to understand what EKGs are all about, what we're going to talk about on Friday. Now, the cardiac muscle contraction. Again, this is going to be a very brief summary of what you learned in AMP1. I don't have the time to go through the muscle contraction in detail. So the event, you have this action potential that's going to go through the nerve axon. All right? This is going to increase the sodium going in until it reaches its terminal end, the axon terminal just before it gets to the cardiac muscle cell. This is going to allow calcium that's in the... You guys learned... axon of the neuron. This is our cardiac muscle cell. The axon terminal gets very close to the muscles, doesn't touch it. We call this the neuromuscular junction, right? You learned about that a long time ago. The neuromuscular junction. This is called the synaptic cleft. Okay? This is this membrane here is the presynaptic membrane. This membrane over here is the postsynaptic membrane. It gets very close but never touches. Going back to where I'm from, New Jersey is very close to Pennsylvania, but it never touches. Why? The Delaware River is separating New Jersey and Pennsylvania. If this is Pennsylvania, and this, well, let's do the other way since I'm from New Jersey. And I'm doing the opposite. Let's say this is New Jersey, that's Pennsylvania. You've got to cross the Delaware River to get the other side. The Delaware River is a synaptic cleft. It's loaded with calcium here. This is what's going to happen. As the action potential comes down here, it's then going to allow calcium that's in the synaptic cleft 
to move in. Inside the, inside the axon terminal, you have these vesicles. And in the vesicles, you're going to have neurotransmitters. In this case, acetylcholine. And what's going to happen here is as calcium comes inside, it binds to the vesicles and allows the vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane. When it does, it releases the acetylcholine going across the synaptic cleft, going across the Delaware River through exocytosis. And that acetylcholine, which are the neurotransmitters, will actually bind to the receptors, the docking areas on the other side. And kind of push the button over here to set an, an action potential to go down now this muscle to cause a contraction. All right, they go down the T tubules and so forth. All right, and I want to go into the myosin and actin and all that stuff, but that's what happens. Okay, to read that on your own as a review, but that's what's going on over there. Now, the only difference is between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, or there's a lot of differences, but the ones I want you to understand. For cardiac muscle, it's the same, same steps as 1 through 5, as I mentioned over there, and steps 9 through 12 are the same. Just refer back so you see what 1 through 5 and 9 through 12 are. However, there's no step 13, so there's no measures of uh, relaxation of cardiac muscle. Calcium does that. But for six, seven, and eight, here's the differences. The muscle action potential spreads over the cell membrane and enters the T tubules. If you remember those, there's the tubules that kind of go down into the muscle. And then the action potential goes down onto the T tubules. When it does that, we have to get calcium out of the sarcoplastic reticulum. However, there is not enough calcium in the sarcoplastic reticulum to actually cause the actin and myosin to contract. So we have to have another way to get more calcium out there. The calcium will then also come from the extracellular fluid and enter the cell. We need more calcium to do that. But that's still not enough. So, inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the SR, there's special stores of other calcium that wasn't released before. And once this calcium comes from the extracellular fluid enters here, it opens up the doors of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release even more calcium. Now, with those three sources of calcium, this is enough to actually cause the contraction. All right? Calcium is very important. You've learned about calcium, as I said before, from kindergarten. Calcium makes your bones and teeth strong. That's really secondary when you find out that calcium is much more important with nerve stimulation, muscle contraction. It's also needed to form clots, right? You learned about that with the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, all right? Calcium is much more important for that. That's why you need to understand what osteoblasts and osteoclasts do to get the calcium levels up to par in your bloodstream.
All right, and these are just pictures from a color a little bit easier. If you read these things over there, it's everything I explained. Okay, some clinical applications so that you understand the concept, the significance of this. There's a medication called digitalis digoxin. This is really, there's two medications that uh, are the oldest medications in the world, and yet they're still in existence. Digoxin is one of them, this digitalis, same thing. The other one you all know, we talked about it. What's a prostaglandin inhibitor? Give me an example of a prostaglandin inhibitor. Something that's going to block prostaglandins from doing their job. Aspirin. A lot of good effects with aspirin, but in the wrong hands or too much hands, it could actually cause a lot of side effects that you don't want either. Well, anyway, the digitalis is a medication that will inhibit the sodium potassium pump. Now, this is what happens. Because we've got to keep, this is for people who have congestive heart failure. For some reason, their heart is not pumping properly, efficiently. So we've got to keep the calcium into the cell for a long amount of time, extending that plateau phase. So this is what normally happens. As sodium goes out, potassium comes in. Sodium's got to come back in, and it's going to push calcium out. Does that make sense? These are antiports, right? You learn about those. Well, with digitalis, we're going to block the sodium potassium pump, at least in a few places in the heart. So if you, this way, you're not going to put sodium back in here, which means the sodium doesn't want to go back in here, which means the calcium is going to stay in the cell for a longer amount of time, thus giving you a longer plateau phase, a stronger contraction of the next contraction. Okay? 